BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Clues to the identity of this week's great life. Bowler hat, toothbrush moustache, funny walk and a cane. And if you still haven't guessed who it is, then I will also tell you that I'm talking about arguably the most famous British silent film star ever, Charlie Chaplin. He's the choice of today's guest, comedian and writer Mark Steele. Mark, as, as he was um, a silent artist, I, I suppose the best tribute to him would be 28 minutes of radio silence. <laughs> yeah, well, this did happen once. The BBC broadcast uh, The Gold Rush, a silent film, and uh, on the radio. And it was just, yeah, exactly that. Well, probably more than that, an hour, however long the film is, of just people laughing and you could hear the piano and that... <laughs> They so might prefer that I think to it us. It went down very well in the audience. I'm sure the people at home will have loved it. I go to be honest and, and say I've never really given Charlie Chaplin much thought. I've, I've seen some of his black and white films. They, they were obligatory viewing at children's birthday parties when I was little. But I've never been particularly captured by his humour. I never really got the point. I, I just don't find slapstick funny. What am I missing? Uh, well, I think the first thing that you're missing, and this is not your fault at all, is that the, one of the tragedies of Chaplin is that he's been thought of as just a slapstick entertainer mm. and ideal for children's parties and Saturday morning television in the 1960s and so on. And yet the themes he was dealing with were work and the, uh, Easy Street, there's a heroin addict in it. These were really serious films. He was much more poignant than that. And I think, you know, we, you, you can argue about whether he's funny or not, and that it largely is down to personal taste. But clearly millions of people did find him extraordinarily funny, enough that he was the the biggest film star in the world. And at the same time, the poignancy uh, of Chaplin is such that he arguably more, well, I think almost certainly more than any other person who would have called himself a comic, he actually changed, he did change the, the world. And so those two things he did, not separately, but together, I mean, that, that's, I, that's not bad. As an egomaniac right. comic myself, I think oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pretty jealous of that. You're right that as an adult, I did begin to see the the poignancy, um, almost the, the the tragedy in the performance. So, the, so the tramp like figure that people associate with Charlie Chaplin, that wasn't just supposed to be funny. Uh, I don't think so. Chaplin was an anarchist in a way, in mm. that he hated the idea of people's individuality being destroyed and becoming part of a machine. He was in America at a time when the tramp was seen, it was almost revered, particularly by people on the left, as some as people who were staying outside of the mechanisation, the industrialisation of society. And in particular, tramps were being... Uh, in America were being hounded. There was a, a, a couple of weeks before Chaplin adopted the persona of the tramp. There were incidents in which um, hundreds of tramps were being uh, attacked by the by the cops. They were seeking refuge in uh, churches and so on. And it was exactly that point that Chaplin adopted the persona of the tramp. And I'm not sure if he did it consciously as mm. a protest, but certainly it would have been in his mind that there was something about the tramp that said, I'm outside of the, the mechanised society that is being imposed upon the mass of the population. Do you remember when you first came across him? Uh, I first came across him in the way that I was describing, as on, on sort of Saturday morning, yeah. it'd be Laurel and Hardy, and then it'd be Buster Keaton, and then it'd be Charlie Chaplin. And I would think, oh, yeah, he's a funny little man, and there's a, you know, there's, there's certain bits of slapstick that, as a kid, you do love. But I didn't, it wasn't, I don't know, I must have been into my late 20s before I thought, oh, blimey, there's all this to this bloke. He was someone, after all, who the Nazis described as a disgusting little Jewish tumbler boring as he is filthy now if was you manage to no he wasn't but it's fascinating that they thought he was what makes a person go into comedy uh, charlie chaplin's case you may say hunger but you were never hungry were you what made you go into comedy i mean it's a really brave thing to do uh oh i don't think it is that brave oh, Matthew, because you're sort of it's what it's all you can 
do if you're a comic. I mean, I'm just hopeless at everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Did did you fail at a lot of other things? Yeah, I was a milkman and I was pretty much the worst milkman there's ever been. Missed out whole streets, not just the odd house. (laughs) Let's just hear a little bit of Charlie Chaplin, that there isn't much. But here he is speaking, yes, actually speaking, in 1952 as part of a panel discussing his film career and how he manages to do all the different roles in his films. I, I, I don't I don't really quite know. I know this, that uh, I'm very uneasy if other people do it for me. I find the voice rather what I expected, actually. If I, I don't think I've ever heard him. Oh, well, just from I that have. little clip, yes, you get a yeah. sense that he's someone who's learnt to put on yes. a slightly, as you would have had to do in that time, sort of rather ridiculous clipped sort of accent, someone trying to be yeah, posher exactly. than they are. Let, let, actually, let's just listen to it again. I, I, don't, I don't really quite know. I know this, that uh, I'm very uneasy if other people do it for me. Hmm. We'll go on and talk more about this in detail, but let me first introduce uh, Simon Louvish, author of Chaplin, The Tramp's Odyssey. Simon, how do you see Chaplin as a political rebel, a radical like Mark, or just a performer who got a lucky break? Well, he's basically all of these things together. I mean, one thing we have to know, which uh, I think is important to us, Chaplin is often seen as a sort of Hollywood American uh, comedian. Actually, he's one of us. He's a Lambeth boy, born and bred. One of the things that always I wondered about, which I never got an answer, was somebody taught Charles Chaplin music. But that would really make a huge difference on his life. Yeah, I mean, that does make sense because I know that I mean, part of the sort of control freakery of him, if you like, was that he uh, he learnt to play the violin so that he could compose the music for his own films. He wanted to be so much in control of everything. But, of course, he didn't just pick up a violin and play it all day. That wouldn't... <laughs> someone must have taught him, you're right. It was... Uh... Not originally his plan to, to make a career on, on being a, a, a tramp. I, I, it was his American producers, wasn't it, who uh, encouraged well, him? Basically, what happened to Chaplin is that he joined the Fred Carno show, which was a troupe of uh, basically silent comedians. And they were silent comedians because in Britain at that time, if you had any speaking roles in theatre... You had to send the material to the uh, well, Chamberlain, Chamberlain you know, office. Yeah. Carno came up with this idea that if you didn't speak, you could do much more, na- much more naughtier things. Mm. You could do all sorts of variety of what later became known as slapstick. Very, very physical comedy. So Carno was a big show which had lots of uh, different t- troops would go along. And uh, then he, he discovered America. So Carno went to America and Chaplin from 1910 and he traveled to America. And Carnot was then discovered by uh, Max Sennett Studios, who took on Charlie Chaplin. But Chaplin became one of the of the Max Sennett troupe. And that's how it all started. Yeah. I mean, I suppose, I mean, we can never know this. I mean, but I, I would think that even at that point, I thought, no, I'm going to do something that is much more personal and, and poignant when I'm in that position. And I think somewhere in the back of his mind, he must have known that all along. Because as soon as he got the the opportunity to make little films and so on, straight away there was it was just driven by these sort of, by all of these, you know, Easy Street, and these are these quite early films, quite early on. You know, that's, he's a policeman who, who then comes across a woman who's, he has to arrest for stealing a loaf of bread, yeah. but it's to feed her child. So it's a, it's a really poignant um Film, he's a little short film. Well, yeah. I mean, Chaplin's real secret, in the sense, was his observation. He would wander around uh, uh, Los Angeles and he would look at everything. He would look inside the barber shop. He would look at people working in the road and he would sort of internalize all the way in which, because everything was physical gesture. And that really made him particularly special that he could really internalize the way in which other people were. And everything played into his physical movement, and that was. And people said he could do things with his eyes that nobody else could do. I think that's right. I think also that there's a warmth to it. Mm. That that was so. Although he was mimicking the people around him, he actually had a deep affection for the barber uh, and for you know whoever it was for the for well, the woman who was stealing the bread. And so we, he would internalize that. Let, let, let's go back to the start. And before we discuss in more detail what happened to Chaplin in America, look at his origins. He wasn't born in the States. Well, he was born in South London, I'm very happy to say. His 
father was uh, an entertainer, but liked to drink. And I think that most of the time, if Charlie saw his father, it would be in a pub that's still there now, and just opposite. He was basically the an alcoholic. Museum. His father, yeah, was he was an alcoholic. Yeah, and his mum was a singer, and sewed and did various things to try and make ends meet. His yeah. mother probably, through tertiary syphilis, had mental illness. Yeah, and and was taken away from him quite often as a. As a child. The opening pages of his autobiography are the most harrowing descriptions of poverty. It's not just the scale of the poverty, but he describes the emotions of it. And in particular, the most moving bit of all in which he's describing this poverty. Because he was six, am I right in saying six, when he went to the workhouse. And his mum went to the workhouse. Him and his brother Sidney, who was a bit older, were taken in there. And he describes that a sort of sense of anticipation, which you can imagine. Oh, it's something exciting, yes. new. You know, we're going to a new place. This will be fun. What he wasn't aware of, he says, until he went in there, was that his mum was taken away. You weren't allowed to be with your kids in the workhouse. And him and his brother were taken in the other direction. And the reason that's really, that comes back, I think, uh, be, I don't know, I'd be interested to see what you say, Simon, right? I think that if you look at the film The Kid, which was in the early 20s, and uh, the, the story of the kid is Chaplin, the tramp, finds a child uh, in the back of a car for you know, peculiar reasons and raises it as his own. When the child gets to six in the story, then the authorities take the kid away. And Chaplin spent three days on this scene getting it exactly right. At a time when you didn't spend three days making an entire film, he spent three days on this scene. And when, you, when you've when you read that bit in his autobiography, I think it's clear to me in that bit of the film, he's trying to recreate that moment. And I honestly, I've, I, I saw it once, then I read that bit, and it took me about 20 years to be able to watch it again. It's so moving because you know that the, that's moment stayed at the core of him right through his life. Yes, you find Chaplin's desire or need to actually try and get a hold of his past. But the workhouse that he was in was uh, fairly awful, but he was taught to read. Yeah. So but he, that, he, these are the really important things at that time. Either you could you could read and function in society or, or you were stuffed. After the workhouse, Simon, he joined a, a group of clog dancers. Called the Eight Lancashire Lads. Yeah. That was in 1902. But there were tons of acts like that. The music hall was a massive uh, business, mm. a, a, a massive presence. People toured in all these different places. And then he uh, was spotted by a film company. Basically, the troupe that Chaplin went with to America was the Carnot Troupe, which was a British comedy troupe. They had the advantage, again, of it being uh, what we today call slapstick, but a silent comedy as such. Because, again, in America, you're dealing with an audience which does not necessarily speak English. You know, if you want to get to the audience mm. of the sort of ordinary mm. working people, then you've got a lot of people there that either speak German, they speak mm. Polish or whatever. Uh, and so it's your silent theatre was so a big si deal. Silence so, in a polyglot community yes, is the best... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, and that that is really what what essentially makes uh, the, the the cinema flourish. Yeah. in America, you know, that was why it was a Nickelodeon. It was me, just me. just just cost you a nickel. If Chaplin had never gone to America, would he have made it big in Britain? Oh, almost certainly not. I mean, he might have made it. Yeah, you know, there were musical stars. But nothing like he was. I mean, he was immensely famous. You know, the, the biggest crowd in American history was when he turned up at Grand Central Station. The scale of it was enormous. And then, as uh, you know, as indicated, he then became famous around the world, which is remarkable at that time. What no? was it in America, though, Simon, that um, gave him the receptive audience he needed in which to to grow and to become famous that he wouldn't have found in Britain? He told the truth. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite simple. I mean, he basically, he expressed what so many people knew was the underbelly of American society. Mm. And that was there, and it was recognised quite obviously. There's, there's that strength of ability also to understand the cinema 
which is really important in, in Chaplin. It's not just a question, he's a comedian, he makes funny jokes and so on and so forth. There are many other great comedians in, in silent comedy. But somehow he managed to be able to really master the art of film. And that's, I think, what is basically his, his, his big success. So his, radic- his political radicalism is sort of mirrored by a radicalism within film isn't it because Mm. nobody had this sort of idea that it was worth spending all this time and money and effort on one scene and so on you're listening to the great life of charlie chaplin chosen by my guest mark Steele. helping him to tell the story is simon luvish you said simon that he really mastered film he got film and he, he was quite an original how early on did he become able to as it were, call the tune in the films that he was making, because generally in filmmaking in the United States, the the actor doesn't doesn't get to direct. And so he just just decided to move on to another play where he was more famous, and then he he had his own studio. That was the the key. The key, quite soon in 1916, the, the, the Chaplin studio is there, and then everything becomes... His, his idea. So everybody has to wait around in the studio forever and ever and ever until Chaplin has decided what the scene is and how it should be. And then he made the money. And, you know, he received an enormous amount of money for this. So oh, he was able to do what he wanted. confidence yeah. to be yeah. like that is yes. immense. So you've become exactly what all the people going into comedy would ever dream of being. And then you go, no, that is only step one. I'm now going to take, I'm going to get rid of all of you lot and I'm going to use this position to take control of it because I have my own vision of how Mm. I'm going to transform film. That is quite an extraordinary sort of place yeah, but here's the paradox. He was, by this stage, making a lot of money himself. He, he, he w- he'd become a plutocrat, ha- hadn't he, Simon? He almost joined the class of people that he was mocking. He had to become rich because he had to control the studio mm. uh, uh, United Artists that he had set up uh, with, with a couple of other people. So basically he really needed uh, money to be free. There was no doubt about that. I think that's right, but I think also he did love being rich mm. and the, the the scale of the wealth. I mean, there's one statistic I love. He is at one point his income was five times greater than the combined income of all nine members of the Supreme Court. I think he was the second highest paid person in America after the boss of U.S. Steel. He became quite a domineering character, at least as a filmmaker, didn't he? As a director, Simon. Well, the director has to be dominating, so uh, yeah. it's not a problem. I mean, I think that, that Chaplin became rich, but not in the sense that, I mean, he didn't have gazillions of dollars uh, set by. I mean, he spent it on, on doing the films. I think he did love being rich, Simon. I think he loved the. I actually love that about him, that there's a sort of there's a contradiction about it, and that he didn't in any way lose the drive of that sense of empathy with people at the bottom. Mm. I think that's, you know, whatever his political views, whatever you think of them, that empathy that he had with the people in the workhouse and so on, that, that couldn't leave him. He met uh, Gandhi, who was uh, equally there. He was interested in the world. Mm. in that sense. And that interest of his, of course, got him into trouble in America uh, with the entire anti-communist drive. We have a so picture his... here of him uh, meeting, meeting Mahatma Gandhi. Yes. Gandhi. I, I yeah. wonder whether the little boy in Bermondsey ever thought that it would come to this. <laughs> See, I think, I think a bit of him thinks I'm meeting Gandhi, brilliant, yeah, yeah. a great political campaigner, and a bit of him thought, oh, with Gandhi! Yeah. I think he did because he met Churchill as well on the same he trip. Met Churchill and he he yeah he he lectured Churchill about economics. Yeah, uh, he had his own idea about the gold standard, this that and the other. And you know he was an arrogant son of a whatsoever. Lots of famous people wanted to see Chaplin. Actually, Gandhi apparently was the only person whom Chaplin met who had never seen any of his films and didn't know who the hell he was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that annoyed him a little yes. bit. So Gandhi Must is have not seen thinking. the gold rush. No, 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 no. <laughs> but if you'd seen my thing where I, I do don't see Gandhi as being much into India. slapstick, really. <laughs> What this? What the the, the tramp? You just must have. Not you must have. Uh, this, in a way, I think part of the argument for labelling someone's life as a great life, almost inevitably, they will be a magnificent contradiction. They will mm. do something wonderful, and they will also there'll also be a side to them that is unpalatable. You know, and Chaplin clearly was 
flawed. He really wasn't, uh, um, for a great part of his life, he wouldn't have been... Um, he wouldn't have been considered particularly modern. No, I don't think uh, the Me Too movement would. The Me, uh, the yeah. Me Too movie he wouldn't have been. Well, I don't know. I mean, he wasn't... Uh, I don't think there's any evidence that he was abusive particularly, but he did have a fondness for... Well, I, you know, in the end, he married... When he was 54, he married Una, who was 18 at the time. And I think that was his fourth marriage. And I think, um, I said once before, it seems as if uh, finally at the age of 54, he'd found the right teenager to marry. He was charged, what wasn't he, procuring a woman and bringing her over the estate line. Is that right? Well, I, yes, I think that once those charges started to be made, then it was politically charged mm. as well as you know, legally charged. That was the reason given, but really yeah. that the American society was becoming, or the American establishment was becoming hostile to him and wanting to move against him. Um, you think particularly they were out feminist. To get him? Yeah, they yeah. were out. They were out to get him. That's not to defend, you know, everything Chaplin did at all, but that wasn't the reason. No, no. You know, it was a big cachet to marry Chaplin. Then you realised that you had married this kind of really rather monstrous being who sort of, you know, sat on top of the earth and controlled everything. And he was serially unfaithful uh, to his first three Serially unfaithful uh, and uh, had a boundless energy that had to be used somewhere and not always in a very wonderful and nice way. But basically he did actually find a kind of paradise mm. uh, with Una O'Neill. But there was a ra- another rather famous person who had a very different political views who also opted for a toothbrush moustache. Did Charlie Chaplin ever address that? Well, he obviously did make the great dictator. It was really a a mark of genius to understand that he could actually make this film, which was a very dodgy kind of thing to do from the beginning. But it turned out to be very important because it was a film which uh, a lot of people in Hollywood didn't like, a lot of people in America didn't want it to be made. But Roosevelt wanted him to make the film. It was brave as well as clever, wasn't it? It was extraordinarily brave because this was before the, before America was involved in the in the war that he started to make it. And I think at first the American political establishment was hostile to it. Uh, they came round to it because America then got involved in the war. He despised fascism. He had a deep guttural hatred for fascism and you know I think it was an immensely influential film it isn't just an attack on Hitler it's also an attack on the sort of the the western establishment as well most notably with that amazing speech at the end the studio hated the idea yeah the he made his comes, own little speech it didn't came, he? comes yeah. out of character for people who don't know it's very very peculiar but it is quite mesmerizing he makes a six minute speech and that's the end of the film mm. is this speech to the world yeah, and he yeah. one of the things he hates about fascism is because fascism even more than normal society by some degree reduces individuals to being just units to you know in the speeches don't allow your leaders to make you're not machines yeah. but he's addressing that not just not hmm. just to Hitler, he's addressing that to to leaders around the world. He is saying he is making an appeal to people across the world. You are more than just machines. Hmm. Think for yourself. Look up. It's really most extraordinary bit of cinema. Well, you've you've heard you heard that speech again quite recently. It is Obama's speech when he got the presidency. And if you sort of pull out uh, Obama's speech, and you'll see how much of that resonates with Chaplin's speech in The Great Dictator. Wow, I uh, it, that. You should check it out. It, it is very interesting, interesting in that sense. Maybe just a coincidence, but I remember hearing it and think, wow, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is Charlie's speech. Then after the war, um, in 1952, the Americans refused him entry back into America, Simon. Th- yes. Very briefly, how did that happen? Well, what happened is this. In the context of the House Un-American Activities Committee, many people were suspect including, of course, Chaplin, and particularly because during the war, when America joined the Soviet Union in the war, he became very active in aid for Russia, and that's what brought him to the attention. Mm. So he was the main target of the un-American activities because he had never become an American citizen. That was one thing against him. On his way uh, to uh, Premier in, in London, so uh, so his visa was revoked and he was told uh, that he couldn't enter, except he would have to go to Ellis Island and reapply mm. at that point. So he was essentially exiled. And he chose Switzerland, uh, Mark, for, for tax reasons? 
Uh, oh, I suppose that's possible, isn't it? I don't know. Um, maybe my sort of affection for him has overlooked that. But yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the Swiss epilogue, as it were, to his, his life. Did he carry on making good films? Well, the last film yeah. is, a, is, a, is a tragedy. I mean, I can't, I, I can't watch it. Um, the Countess of Hong Kong. Because Marlon Brando was in this film, wasn't he? The... Marlon Brando could not really deal with a director who told him what the character should do. Two great egos that clash. I and think the, the last thing that he did that was truly Chaplin-esque was after he died because <laughs> his coffin was stolen and uh, these thieves went into a garage and they stole his coffin and they lost it on the road and it was just the most magnificently chaplin <laughs> He would have absolutely loved it and they dropped it down some stairs and all sorts of all sorts of wonderful you know that really ought to be on film and done with a uh, <laughs> and done sort of with with some sort of little words over the top oh my god the coffin's fallen down the road <laughs> you've taken us to the the end mark he died in uh, 1977 aged 88. Is his work still relevant, do you think, in the sense that could you just watch him as a, 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 a very good actor and filmmaker or has he now to be seen as a, a, a museum piece? I mean, I saw the, the kid a couple of years ago in a cinema in Lisbon and, um, you know, it was just a very ordinary audience. It wasn't an arty audience particularly and it was... It was brilliant, and I, I think you know. I think there's no doubt that if it was shown in the right way, if you just put it on a Saturday morning and go right, we're going to have a bit of this, and then going to have someone tipping green liquid on someone as part of a Saturday morning kids thing or something, that's in the you know you're obviously looking at it in the wrong way. In the... I think that was my mistake. I think I was probably getting him wrong. You've both persuaded me of that, and echoing you both, Mary Pickford, an actress who was once known as America's sweetheart during the twenties, and a former business partner of Chaplin, once said, Charlie was the greatest of all comedians. He was also a stinker. You're a comedian, Mark. Would you have been able to work and get along with your great life? <laughs> I think he would have been a nightmare to meet. Uh, and I think he would be someone you'd be starstruck at meeting. And then, I don't know, mate. I don't know. I've no idea whether he would be warm towards you if you if he noticed that or whether he would just be interested in whatever he had to do next to make the film. I don't know. Probably best we don't meet him, isn't it? We can only speculate. Thank you, Mark Steele and Simon Luvish, for championing the great life of Charlie Chaplin. And let's leave the final words to the man himself, Sir Charles Chaplin. If you could do it all over again, Charlie, would you do anything different from what you have done? Oh, no. No, I don't want to even go back. I just want to keep going forward, forward, forward. 